Our topic tonight is international development, the interests of the United States and the role of the United Nations. And our guest, as you know, is Mr. James E. Baker, who serves as a director in the office of the Director General uh, for Development and International Economic Cooperation at the United Nations. Clearly, the, the questions of international order in the 21st century will involve economic matters as much as national security matters or perhaps more. And the list of outstanding problems and dilemmas are almost endless as one speculates <coughs> as to what will be in the best interest of the United States in the next century. We're delighted, though, uh, to have with us someone who is deeply experienced in the United Nations, which will have a role in this, and deeply experienced in matters of international economics. Mr. Lewis is a graduate of Haverford College. I did, remember, Steph, I've called Mr. Baker Mr. Lewis because of Jim Lewis <laughs> constantly for the last two months. And I said to a member of our staff that I certainly will say Lewis when the time comes and I've done it. <laughs> James Baker. But Jim Lewis could do a fine job, too, on this <laughs> subject. But he isn't a graduate of Haverford, nor did he get his master's degree from Fletcher a school of diplomacy. Mr. Baker <laughs> joined the Foreign Service in 1961. He's been posted in Niger, in Tokyo, Pretoria, at the Department of State. He served in the Office of International Trade Policy. He's been uh, in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of State for Economic Affairs, and he's been in the Office of Monetary Policy. He has served in the United States Mission at the United Nations as a Senior Advisor for Economic and Social Affairs and as Minister Counselor for Economic and Social Affairs. He's held offices at the United Nations. He was Principal Officer within the same office that he presently serves. He was also Director of Special uh, Economic Assistance Programs at the United Nations. And as I said, he now serves as a Director within that office of development and economic, international economic cooperation. The topic's interesting, and we're absolutely delighted to have Mr. Baker uh, to share his wisdom this evening with us. Mr. Baker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bird. Um, if you think you have identity problems, <laughs> let me start off by apologizing to those here who thought they were coming to hear the Secretary of State. <laughs> in point of fact, there really isn't very much of a problem in my life. We tend to travel in slightly different circles. But there was one moment, and this is the truth, in which I found myself talking with Henry Kissinger on the telephone, which was a bit of a surprise to the both of us, since we neither meant this. <laughs> Actually, I have an even more serious problem, and that is I've had to do a lot of traveling in Africa. Um, and I would go into the hotel in which I was checking in, and I would say, my name is Jim Baker, I have a reservation. Uh, and there would be a pause, and all of a sudden, the person at the desk would throw up their hands and say, Praise the Lord. <laughs> it took me a long time to catch on that the other Jim Baker with two Ks uh, was the most popular radio evangel evangelist in Southern Africa. I'm absolutely de delighted to be here. Uh, Baltimore is a sort of surrogate home for me, believe it or not. Even though I haven't lived here, it's been a place I've come back to a great deal. Uh, and I'm delighted to join you tonight. I don't like making speeches, uh, and so I'm not looking forward with any pleasure at all to the first part of this exercise. Uh, but I very much like discussing, and so I really am looking forward and hope that, that when I get through, we can have a, a serious discussion for a change. <coughs> 
The topic, international development, the interest of the United States and the role of the United Nations, and don't ask me why I picked that topic, because it, it covers everything. But let, let's start off looking, um, as it suggests, at the 21st century. If you were to ask a weatherman how to predict tomorrow's weather, and instead of being you know, a scientist, he decided to be honest with you, he would probably tell you, describe what happened today, and you're 80% accurate. Which really is a, reflects a truism that macro change is a rather gradual process. Uh, and thus, when we try to begin to think about what the 21st century is going to look like, and what the international economic order of the 21st century will look like, a good starting point is to look at today, look at the end of the 20th century, and in particular at the emerging trends which, which might well influence the future course of events. I don't propose to do this any, in any comprehensive way, mainly because of time limitations, but also mm, certain personal capacity limitations. Uh, but just a few thoughts from my perspective and, and, and where I'm sitting and how I look at it. If you were to look at the international economy today, I suspect that there's some very good cause for satisfaction. In aggregate terms, the world economy continues to expand, at, you know, perhaps at lower levels than it should or could, but it is continuing to expand. And for all the major industrialized countries, the prognosis, the prospects, are basically for continued non-inflationary growth. All sorts of other indicators contribute to this. International trade is expanding, and things look pretty good. Not that there aren't problems, of course. Every, every situation has problems, but the overall perspective, in an aggregate sense, um, is, is pretty, pretty OK. And what is perhaps most impressive about this is that it, is, it demonstrates the flexibility and the resilience of the various instrumentalities of international economic transaction. Because in point of fact, in the last few years, we've gone through some rather rocky periods. We've had minor recessions. We've had stock market fluctuations. Um, and the point is, somehow, we seem to have weathered it, we, the world. Um, and things, in, in many ways, look copacetic, a word I've always wanted to use. Um, but there are some aspects of the picture which I think really should be a uh, cause for grave concern. And for my part, one of the most serious bases of concern is the growing gap between rich and poor countries. The pattern of growth which I described earlier that's generally optimistic picture, this growth simply has not been evenly distributed. Some countries have grown more than others. Uh, and there's nothing unusual about that. There's, there's nothing in the world that says things will be, be equitable all the time. I learned very early on that, that some people grow faster than others. Um, nor is the concept of a gap between rich and poor countries, per se, a new thought. We, we've discussed this in the literature and in the, in the discussions of international development over the years. There is a gap between the rich and the poor. But in the past, when we talked about the gap, what we really were saying is that the poorer countries were not growing as fast as the richer countries. They were growing, but not as fast. And therefore, there was this gap developing. <coughs> what we're looking at today is a slightly different and a far more serious phenomenon. And that is simply that an increasing number of countries are not growing or, in fact, are stagnating. This is true for most of the countries of Africa. This is true for many countries in Latin America. This is true for an awful lot of countries in Asia. They're falling off the end of the table. And this is a different phenomenon than, than not growing fast enough. The human dimensions of this are slightly staggering. After you know, very serious effort on everybody's part, we were beginning to see some positive trends in what are called social indicators. We're now beginning to look at negative trends in many parts of the world. Negative trends in areas such as infant mortality, nutrition, health care, illiteracy, social services, housing, etc. Things are going down in these parts of the world. 
the number of people living in absolute poverty. And we have a very generous measure of what is absolute poverty. The number of people living in absolute poverty is increasing. And you know, these are horseback estimates, but, but roughly we're talking about one-fifth of the total population of the world. The number of people suffering from hunger and malnutrition is increasing, even though we well know, or we do have the capacity to produce enough food to feed everybody. The political dimensions of this are as serious as the social. These are situations that obviously grow, cause great social internal tensions. People are hungry and they're not happy. But equally, the whole process of governance becomes increasingly difficult. If it is not possible to indicate some hopeful, some hopeful prospects for the future. At the United Nations, we have a continuing parade of, nation, of national leaders coming in saying, I cannot longer or any longer ask for sacrifice unless I can show that there is some benefit out of the sacrifice, out of the effort. And the result is that my government is in danger. So that what we're talking about is not just an economic phenomenon. It's a human phenomenon, and it's a political phenomenon. There's a lot of debate going on today. There has been for some time about why this is happening. One of the arguments is that it basically reflects mismanagement by the various national authorities. And no one would deny, including the governments themselves, that this is, is true in many cases and that there is a need for improvement. But the pervasiveness of this, uh, this phenomenon suggests that, that, that there's much more to it than that. There's a much wider field of causality. It's not difficult to identify some of the, the, the contributing factors. For example, it is not happenstance that most of the countries in, experience stagnant or declining growth fall into categories of the heavily indebted countries. And thus, somehow, trying to resolve the debt problems of these countries is a really sine qua non for the revitalization of their economies. Similarly, many of the countries that we're talking about are heavily dependent on the export of one commodity. And we're looking at a decline in commodity prices. And this has obviously contributed to it. Population is, is a major factor. Population is one of the biggest time bombs we're looking at over time. Basic to be here, I would, over you know, in the 21st century. We're going to face, face some very serious problems between the number of people in the world and the capacity of the resources of the world to support those people. All of these things, so. But I, I, I really don't want to focus on the what's and the why's of this tonight. The point I would like to make, the central point I would like to make, is that at the present time, in the current context of international economic op operations, a major portion of humanity is simply being marginalized, pushed out of the picture. They're not participating. They have, they're not a part of the game. And unless there's something rather conscious and deliberately done to reverse this process, chances are that it will only get worse. Let me give you an example. It is very clear that in the 21st century, access to and the application of new technologies is really going to be a fundamental determinant of economic viability. If you cannot be technologically up to date, you can't compete out there anymore. Right? But how can countries, who be, or which, I guess, who, which, um, countries that are, are having very serious current economic difficulties and as a result are curtailing the training of scientists and technologists already in short supply. How can they hope to compete in this 21st century world? And unless somehow they can get into the bandwagon, into the, the system, the prospect is that they are going to be marginalized even more as, as, as history goes on or as, as the world goes on. It's a cumulative process. Uh, we're looking at education budgets being cut back. Fine, but then your next generation isn't going to be able to help you develop. 
we're looking at cutbacks in basic investment. Again, these may be necessary, but if you don't invest today, you don't have very much tomorrow. So this is a cumulative process and one that, that, that I suspect is expanding exponentially. <coughs> And, I sus and, and well, all I'm suggesting, I guess, is that a major problem, and I suspect a major concern, I hope a major concern, of the 21st century, of the international economic order of the 21st century, is somehow, how do we deal with this? Because if we don't, we really are going to be living in a very tenuous sort of economic, political, and social world. Let's move on to something a little more, a little less depressing, perhaps. Uh, one of the things that I think is very clear when we look at the end of the 20th century, uh, and which will be very dominant for the 21st century, uh, is the growing reality and appreciation of the interdependence of nations. Again, this is not a new concept. People have talked about the interdependence of nations for a long time. It's in the literature. Tremendous lip service has been given to it. But I, I really think that it's, it's acquired a new reality and a new appreciation uh, that is significant. For example, it is one thing to talk about a global financial market. We've talked about a global financial market. It's another thing to sit, as we all did during the recent decline in the stock market, and watch the impulses be transmitted from New York to Chicago to San Francisco, to Tokyo, to Hong Kong, all around the world, Paris, London, and back to New York. Um, part of this is simply a communications revolution. Things move faster. Money moves faster. Um, but it is a brand new world. There are two different, perhaps, but perhaps interrelated aspects of, of this international independence. On the one hand, it means that everything we do, or any other country does, impacts well beyond national boundaries. Needless to say, this rather complicates the process of national government or national governance, whatever you want to call it. A decision by the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington on its domestic interest rates now must not only take into account the various economic variables inside the United States, but we've also got to look at its impact on others and their reactions to whatever decision we make. The requirement is thus for increased international cooperation and coordination in the management of our domestic economies. And that's, that's a little new. We've talked about cooperation out there. But we now have to cooperate in the ma management of our domestic economies. Equally significant, though, is that there are, there are a growing number of problems which are simply no longer susceptible to national solution. Perhaps the most pressing issues on a lot of national agendas these days are drugs and environment. And the one thing we know for sure is that no individual nation state can effectively deal with these issues. If you want to have an effective campaign in the area of drugs, you simply are going to have to have the active participation of the countries that produce drugs, the countries that process them, the countries that transship them, and the countries that use them. Similarly, no matter what we do in the United States, for example, to halt pollution, to clean up our atmosphere, nothing, none of this works unless our neighbors join us, and in turn, our neighbors' neighbors, and, and we're getting out there. I suspect that the number of issues falling into this category, issues requiring international collective action to be effectively dealt with, uh, will be increasing in the, 19, uh, in the 21st century. In the last few weeks, we have been witnessing some rather startling developments in East Europe, unpredictable, perhaps, but certainly not planned at the pace. Uh, and all of these, these pose some very complicated challenges and, and opportunities today. 
But in a more long-term sense, one of the things these developments represent is an expansion in the membership of the international global community. In point of fact, up until now, when one talked about international economic order or international economic development or whatever, we tended to put the centrally planned economies of East Europe and the Soviet Union off on the side. They, they really were not participants, and this was, was reasonably accurate in the sense that they weren't that interested in being participants. But what is emerging now, and it's very clear, is that that isolation is gone. Uh, in the immediate days, we will be faced with the problem of the integration um, of these economies um, into an international economic system. Um, and these will pose some, some serious challenges as we go along. Incidentally, developments in East Europe also underline another trend which has clearly emerged in the closing days of the 20th century, uh, which I would describe as a loss of faith in centrally planned economic activity. It's not to say, I mean, uh, don't jump up and shout, Hosanna, we've not gone back to laissez-faire free enterprise. But the concept that you run everything from a centrally planned authority has been pretty much totally discredited, not only in East Europe, but around the world. And one can go country by country, area by area, and see that. <coughs> and the counterpart is a sense of recognition that it really is human enterprise which is the driving force of economic activity. Uh, and this, in a sense, sort of changes the philosophy of a lot of the way the world economy has worked. And one of the things we will be juggling in the 21st century will be this, this sense of private enterprise, if you like, um, public action, planning. It's going to be a much more complicated game we're into. Moving on from, from this interdependence idea, but very closely related is that it seems to me that there is a growing appreciation of the interrelatedness of issues. Again, if I could use drugs as an example, the only way you can convince a poor peasant to stop growing cocaine is to provide him with alternate opportunities to feed his family. And the only way you can do that is to get into questions of rural agricultural development. And the only way you can do that is to get into questions of national development strategy. And this involves you immediately into questions of commodity prices and ODA flows and indebtedness. It's all, it's all there linked together. Uh, this has always been the case. But I think that, that this sense of reality um, is, is coming coming much more upon us. In sum, the management of the global economy in the 21st century will increasingly require collective and comprehensive action on the part of, of the state's members of the international community. Just as a sort of final and passing comment, and this is immediately very quick run through of some current trend, I would note that international economic power is being increasingly dispersed and reorganized. This is not to say that it's a brand new world, that the major economic powers will not continue to exercise tremendous influence over the course of human events. But there will be new patterns of association, which among other things are going to preclude dominant influence by any one country. That, that's rather nicely put, dominant influence by the United States. The creation of the European Economic <coughs> Community um, is symbolic of this sort of development. And incidentally, the association between the United States and Canada uh, also represents a reassociation, a re a rethinking, a reorganization of political uh, structures for international economic cooperation. Uh, and I suspect this sort of trend is going to develop even more into the future. <coughs>
The other part of this, of course, is simply that new actors are emerging on the economic scene. Certainly the last of the 20th century will be dominated by the emergence of Japan as a major economic power with its own interest. We're looking at another group of countries. I hate the name, the so-called NICs, newly industrialized countries. Uh, countries like Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, which are coming into the international market uh, and which will have an impact and whose interest will have to be taken uh, into account uh, as we think our way to, through the future. I don't know if you're struck as I am by a certain sense of contradiction in trends of what I've been saying to you so far. I've been suggesting that there is a greater need for deliberate action by nation states in a collective manner to address a whole wide array of issues in a comprehensive manner. But equally implicit in what I've been saying is that national governments have a decreasing capacity to act. In one hand, actions are being transferred into the private sector. On the other hand, developments are taking actions out of the hands of national governments. I mentioned earlier the international financial market. In point of fact, no government now can control the flow of resources around the world. Uh, we just can't do it anymore. It, it, it's electronically transferred and it's all gone and off. So we're, we're going to have this tension between the need for collective and deliberate action um, and a capacity to respond, especially at the national government uh, at the national government level. And I suspect that one of the interesting, if you like, sub themes that we're going to be looking at in the 21st century is a redefinition of the concept of national sovereignty as we play it out in the international economic scene. I'm not talking world government. I, that, I leave that for political scientists. But, and, and incidentally, this is nothing new. We have functionally, in the past, given up little bits of sovereignty in areas uh, in which it was found useful to do so. We don't have very much control over international postal services. We joined an agreement with the Universal Postal Union years ago to sort of say, if you conform to certain rules, this mail will be delivered, and we don't give a hoot about your political interest in it. So we do surrender, and we have surrendered, functionally, little aspects of sovereignty as a matter of practical interest. But I suspect the question is going to broaden, uh, and it's not going to be quite as clear as it has been in the past. Um, against this skeletal, sketchy, comments on, on some of the trends that I see for the 21st century. Let me now turn and make a few comments on the role of the United Nations and in turn on the interest of the United States. One of the things that I've discovered in addressing audiences and meeting with groups such as this that while, is that while there is a general awareness among American people of the role and responsibilities of the United Nations in the political and social, uh, political and, and security areas, much less is known uh, about what the United Nations does um, in the economic and social side of things. To a certain extent, this reflects the original thinking underlying the Charter. As the world was emerging from the Second World War, it is understandable that the focus of, an, of attention was on ways and means of preventing this sort of tragedy happening again. And so we were all trying to make sure that we made all the necessary political arrangements to avoid it. And when you look at the United Nations as an institution, the only body in the United Nations which really has the authority to act as opposed to recommend is the Security Council. Uh, and the Security Council was established to, to deal with issues of peace and security. I am told, I must say I've never looked it up, that the original drafts of the Charter made no provisions whatsoever in the economic and social field, and this was added during the negotiation process leading to the final signature 
However it came about, the Charter does establish as a fundamental principle of the United Nations, and I quote, to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character. In a sense, this represented a fundamental logic, namely that there is a very close link between peace and security and economic development, economic and social development. When the Charter was written, it was envisaged that most of the activities of the United Nations in the economic and social field would actually be carried out in the various agencies called specialized agencies, which already existed in 1945 or which were established in the area of human training and labor activities, there's the International Labor Organization, the Food and Agricultural Organization for Food, WHO, the World Health Organizations, there are the Bretton Woods Institutions of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. There are, in fact, 14 agencies out there which are independent, autonomous. They have their own legal status uh, and theoretically have a functional area of responsibility. And the idea was the basic work would be done out there in these, quote, technical agencies. The United Nations was to enter into relationship agreements with these specialized agencies to create what's called the UN system and to exercise a overall and to a certain extent or rather they coordination role through something called the Economic and Social Council which unlike the Security Council does not have the power to act but can only make recommendations. The subsequent evolution of economic and social activities in the United Nations reflects more than anything else changes in the membership of the United Nations. It was 50 odd countries that were in San Francisco to sign the charter in 1945. The present membership of the United Nations is 159. And most of the new countries came from the third world or developing countries. The new members shared, I'm sure, a concern about peace and security, but they were faced with equally urgent problems of economic and social development and of survival. And thus, over time and in response to the initiatives and the concerns of these countries, the organizations began to just sort of develop activities um, in the economic and social field. This was done without a great master plan and somewhat haphazardly, and, and the result looks a little bit like the house that Jack built. And it was almost with a certain sense of surprise that we looked up in the mid-70s to discover that three quarters of the total budget of the United Nations is devoted to economic and social activities as opposed to political and peace activities. I don't want to go through the list of what these activities are because they would take a, a volume. I would only suggest that I defy anyone in this room to come up with an economic and social activity in which the United Nations is not involved in one way or another. And I mean that quite literally across the board. We have a book like this outlining the areas in which we're operating in the economic and social field. Probably, if we have a problem, is that we're operating in too many areas than we can handle, but we're, we're there. That's all I can say. I would have to say that there still isn't a clear agreement on the role of the United Nations in economic and social affairs. And this is, is, is a continuing problem that I'll come back to in another context. For obvious political reasons, <coughs> namely the political weight that they enjoy with one country, one vote. Developing countries would like the United Nations to be seen as the central forum for the negotiation um, of outstanding economic and social issues. For equally obvious reasons, developed countries uh, would rather prefer the technical institutions such as the World Bank and so forth, in which they happen to enjoy greater political leverage as well. And underlying all of this, of course, is a rather central issue of multilateralism, uh, namely the degree to which individual countries appreciate the need 
and are willing to seek common action in the resolution of problems. The United Nations carries out, or how do I put it, operates at roughly three levels in dealing with economic and social affairs. In the first instance, it is a normative exercise in which we try to establish basic international standards of conduct in specific areas. The most recent has been the elaboration of a convention on the rights of children, uh, which was just approved by the General Assembly last month. In addition, the United Nations carries out a whole range of what we call operational activities, essentially technical assistance to developing countries in, in, in various um, disciplines required. It's not the world's biggest program. We're about $8 billion a year, which is less than, say, the United, Na United States bilateral aid program. But given the universality of its coverage and its apolitical nature, uh, it is one that, that developing countries at least find extremely useful. And finally, and perhaps most important, the United Nations is a forum for discussion and negotiation. One of the few places where any country can walk in and say, I got a problem, and there's a built-in audience. You don't want to be there at times, but you've got to listen. Um, and, and this is, is, is a, I think, a very important um, attribute. And, and the quality of the discussions uh, can vary, but they're important. Anyway, implicit in my opening comments on the nature of the international order in the 21st century is a conviction, I guess, personal conviction, that multilateralism must be, um, must be the order of the day. Because we don't have much choice but moving toward uh, a multilateral approach to a lot of the questions we deal, are dealing with. After some periods of difficulty, and then, you know, really at the end of the 20th century, the last 10 years, we've, we've had some downers in terms of multilateralism, and a growing sense at those during that period um, that things were better dealt with outside of the United Nations for one, and by individual countries or small groups of countries uh, on the other side, but, but a general multilateral approach uh, was weak uh, during the 70s and parts of the 80s. In a sense, it's back on the rise again, I think. Um, and to some extent, this is, is already reflected in the current schedule of meetings and the work of the United Nations. In January, we will, in fact, we've already had a series of meetings trying to think our way through an international development strategy for the 1990s, the international development decade. And next week, we'll start a series of meetings again on discrimination against women. In February, there's going to be a special session of the General Assembly on drugs. In April, there will be a special session to deal with international economic cooperation, in particular, the revitalization of growth in developing countries. We've agreed at the last General Assembly to schedule in 1992 a major conference on environment and development. The agenda's there. Um, which, uh, this is, and believe me, that's a very summary sampling of, of what's on the agenda. But there is, I think, a growing sense that in these areas, um, it is important uh, to reassert, to reaffirm the validity of multilateralism as a way of effective solution. Like a lot of other bodies, it's been said that if the United Nations did not exist, we would have to create it. And what it is, is a universal body in which all the nations of the world can meet on equal terms to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. And this remains a rather fundamental purpose of the United Nations. If my prognosis for the 21st century is true, the United Nations will have even more important role to play in managing this interdependent, interrelated, comprehensive economic system. But the United Nations is, in effect, an instrumentality, and its capacity to, to act and to be effective is a function of the commitment of nation states, of member states, 
which I guess brings me to my last set of comments, namely the interest of the United States. I'm going to start off in, in, in a global sense and simply say as a general statement, I would hope that there would be no disagreement with the proposition that the United, United States does not have the option to retreat from the international economy and it really wouldn't be in our interest to do so if the option existed. A bit, the practical reasons for this. We stand to better prosper the more prosperous the world around us is. We, 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 this works. Um, but equally important, I, I happen to think that there's something central to the American traditions, and I'm wearing my U.S. hat now as opposed to my U.N. hat, uh, which is a, a genuine concern about our fellow human beings and a genuine effort to make this a better place to live. I know this sounds a little corny, um, but what is struck by it every now and then? I was very much involved in the emergency um, assistance to Africa program during the drought in 1984 to 87, roughly. And the U.S. government uh, played a very positive and supportive role and, and was greatly appreciated. But what really overwhelmed us was not the government response, it was a very private response. Little people in Peoria, I don't know where Peoria is, but little people all over the world would sit and watch television programs of starvation in Ethiopia and go to the local grocery store and buy a box of cornflakes and mail it to Javier Perez de Cuellar, Secretary General of UN. He didn't know what to do with it, so he sent it to our office, and we began to look like a rubbish. <laughs> no, but, but the real point is, is that there is, in a funny way, in the American population, in the American populace, this genuine sense, a sense of, of concern, so that, that we're in the world economy, both because we're going to benefit from it, but equally because, I hope because, we are concerned about it. Now, unfortunately, one cannot say that the United States is a totally benign influence in the world, much less a totally good influence in the world. There are some problems that we're going to have to deal with which are impacting seriously on international economic activity. Don't want to get into the technicalities, but there's a whole realm of things called internal external balances. And what it really says is that, let me write it differently. When a developing country gets into trouble, they generally say, go to the IMF and, and negotiate an adjustment program. And the adjustment programs are really pretty standard, they say. Balance your national budget, balance your trade budget, or trade balance, uh, and make the necessary exchange rates. Now, by those standards, you must appreciate um, there are some actions needed in the United States to get our house in order. <laughs> if this, as I say, if this were just a benign activity, fine and dandy, that, that this goes along. But one of the results, and, and people aren't, I don't think, that aware of it, the United, Na United States has now become a magnet of, for funds. The way we're financing our imbalances, the way we're financing our uh, budget imbalance, the way we're financing our trade imbalance, is by sucking up money out in the international market. Again, if it's just between us and them, I'd, I'd leave that to the, to the bankers to work out. But what it means is, for example, developing countries wanting to raise money are competing with the U.S., and believe it or not, they lose. So that, that the kind of internal imbalance we now have not only has been in the long run probably not good for us, but it is creating a very serious problem in the financial markets of the world now in terms of the distribution. Related to this is, is a really sort of frightful fact for which we're not individually responsible. Developing countries have now become net transfers, FERS, F-E-R-E-R-S, of resources to the developed world. The general idea is these are the poor countries and we're sending aid and loans and so forth to help them develop. Okay? So that 
the money is going to them. No. We're talking of something in the order of 200 I always get my billions and mixed up. Um, let me use billions, because I think that's true. Of dollars that are coming out of developing countries and coming back to the rich countries. And I, I really find this rather difficult to explain. It's happening. But not to explain, to justify. The point being, and in, in what I'm getting at, I guess, and this, that latter was not particular to the US, Though we do participate in, um, is that the developed world in general, the U.S. in particular, really is going to have to do some adjustments because some of our activities and some of our situations are in fact disruptive of, of good international economic order. Anyway, um, we're in the international economy, um, and we can't or don't want to get out. Um, where do we go from here? One is clear that the United States uh, is going to have to do some adjustments to the probable realities of the 21st century, and a truly global economy with the greater interdependence of nations and a greater interrelatedness of issues, played out on a changing political turf. In a sense, this has already started, and, and what we're going to see in the 21st century is, is watching it play out and how well it's played out. But it's a very difficult process. It involves resisting the temptation of short-term actions to protect domestic interest. Um, I should hope that, that I don't need to remind people in this room of the reality of, 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 of pressures for protection, uh, for, for measures which resolve in a very short-term basis, immediate domestic problems, but which in the long term do not contribute to the kind of adjustment that, in effect, we will have to undertake if we are to continue to participate in the international economy. It involves promoting some domestic adjustments required to retain international competitiveness. That's a broad agenda, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but some of you may have read the recent report or the report that was recently issued on the education system in the United States, which is suggesting that we are training a generation of people who are really not equipped to participate most usefully in a highly technological 21st century. And if we don't have a working force that is effective, in maintaining our competitiveness, we will lose it. We have a savings rate in this country that is very low. Um, and somehow we've got to begin to generate the kind of resources domestically um, which will permit investments, which will permit the United States to continue to be competitive. There's an incredible agenda of these sort of domestic reform measures. Uh, which obviously will have to be a part of this adjustment process. I think it should involve a continuing commitment to global collective international action to truly and genuinely address global problems such as the environment, such as drugs, such as indebtedness, such as population. And again, this is just an extension of the better the world out there is, the better we are in point of fact. And in a, in a way, and this sounds very easy, and I'm sure people in Washington would kill me, um, it involves developing a vision. What I'm most struck about looking at US international economic policy at this point in our life uh, is that it seems to me to be rather sporadic and rather here, the, thither, and yon. Um, and, and somehow there needs to be put together a coherent vision, if you like, of the international order of the 21st century and how and what we want to get out of it. Uh, so that there is a, a coherence in the way we approach. Let me switch in some final words. I've talked too long already. Uh, on the United 
States and the United Nations. Very briefly, we, we obviously played a major role in the founding of the United Nations. Uh, in recent times, the activity the relationship has become a little more difficult. To some extent, this reflects substantive differences. We don't always agree with the majority of members of the United Nations. We publish a report every year, it's always amusing that the U.S. does, in which we report on the number of times countries did not vote with the United States. <laughs> Our colleagues point out that they would have described this process slightly differently as the number of times the U.S. did not vote with the majority of members of the U.N. Um, and, you know, we, we've gotten into most recently some very serious problems of relating to the administrative efficiency and effectiveness of the United Nations. And out of this whole thing, we've gotten into, I would submit, a very awkward and almost embarrassing position. And that is the United States has fallen into a pattern of not paying its assessed dues to the United Nations. This is a legal obligation under the chart. Right now, the United States is the largest delinquent. We owe approximately $500 million in back dues to the United Nations. The budget of the United Nations is $900 million, so that's not an insignificant fee we're talking about. And I would honestly urge anyone here who can convince Washington, Congress, and the administration that it is, I think, unfortunate that the richest and most powerful country in the world uh, is playing this game. It's unfortunate both in terms of our influence in the United Nations, equally it's unfortunate in, in being a violation, a violation of our international treaty obligations. That, that's that's going to be my one uh, polemic of the evening. Anyway, to, to wind this up very quickly, as I say, in recent years, we, we, we've had difficulties of public imagery. We, the United Nations, have had difficulties of public imagery with the United States. Um, you know, people sort of wondered what we did, why we did, and why we wasted so much money in not doing anything. Um, there's been a bit of a turnaround on this, especially on the political side. The uh, achievements, the successes, quotes, in which the United Nations played a role have given us a slightly better audience. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Namibia, uh, the Sahelian area. All of these things are going for, presumably now, possibly even Cambodia, if the papers are right. And there is a sense that, that perhaps the United Nations is not a total waste of money at all, and we appreciate that. Um, within the organization itself, it seems that we should try to figure out how to build on this new sense of support to be more effective, not, some, not only in the political areas, but also in the economic and social areas. Um, and there's this, also this sense that the growing spirit of East-West cooperation, or at least the, 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 the reduction of tensions between the major powers on both sides, should provide, not a peace dividend, should provide an opportunity to focus not so much on political security issues, but on economic issues and development issues. Um, as I said, the prognosis, or my prognosis, is, is of a greater and a more important role for the United Nations in the 21st century international economic order. But this will require the support of the United States, certainly as one of the major actors. And I hope that we will have and will merit that support. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you very much for, for tackling an uh, enormously complex subject and for treating it comprehensively. Uh, as is our, our custom, those people who do have to leave early should do so now. We will have, have questions until 10 minutes after 7. <laughs> With your UN hat on, would you comment upon the use of military force by the United States in Panama, especially with respect to the drug problem, presumably? 
Well, my human hat on, I would have to say, as a humble civil servant, I never comment on the activities of any member state. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me say this. Um, and I, I, I don't want to comment on whether it's right, wrong, or in between. It does produce a complication. And the complication is, is one of multilateralism again, collective action or non-collective action. We are not going to, the United States, no country, is going to be able to act alone and independently and be effective in dealing with drugs. You are only going to be able to act to the degree that the Colombians, the Panamanians, the Italians, or the, the, the Thai, everybody gets into the part of the game. Uh, and, and it's very important for everyone to understand this and to understand that um, individual initiatives uh, might not contribute to the sense of need for collective action. I apologize, but we do try to depart on schedule. It's 10 minutes after 7, so unfortunately we're going to have to uh, end what has been an extremely uh, informative evening. Uh, it's been enjoyable. And uh, we thank you very much for being with us.